Next up, vascular surgeon Mr. Marek Garbaski from St. John of God talked to us about advances in endovascular surgery, in particular the use of graft stents in the management of aortic aneurysm. Marek, one of the things that GPs are seeing a good deal in particularly their diabetic patients is peripheral vascular disease. Could you talk about some of the advances that have happened in that treatment over the last 10 or 20 years? Especially the last 10 years, the advances in managing peripheral vascular disease and aneurysmal disease are phenomenal. And that's why vascular surgery is so interesting these days because it's not longer just an open surgery. It's actually a combination of endovascular surgery and open surgery these days. And I think the biggest benefit is really benefit for patients because their recovery is much faster. Mm -hmm. The area of complications is much lower and first of all, the number of patients who can be offered interventions is now much wider than it used to be a decade ago. So say if we had a patient with peripheral vascular disease whose feet were going very dusky and blue, what would be the steps that we would take and uh, what would you be doing with them? I think in the rural setting it is still possible to organise very simple and very useful assessment which is assessment of ankylobrachial indices. Yep. We forget quite often about this uh, very simple test and it actually provides phenomenal amount of information. It's very reliable, it's very sensitive and specific and uh, within the setting of any practice it can be easily organised. Yep. Yep. So the next step is really to think about uh, well how how severe the symptoms are, obviously if you have dusky feet and very short distance claudication or even development of breast pain, then you really need to get on with treatment. And the next uh, most sensible investigation will be to try to organize reliable arterial duplex ultrasound because this patient will need to have some intervention. So is that something that we would normally do in the country or something that you would give the patient a form for the city to do in the morning and I see you in the afternoon? I think it's a very good thing to be uh, that one can organize from the GP practice yep. and then patient can be referred and comes to see vascular surgeon with the result of the test available that's excellent because that really just streamlined the patients to the next um, step which is basically intervention in someone with this sort of degree of symptoms. And what sort of interventions are you talking about? Well these days I think it's predominantly in the vascular interventions. Mm -hmm. Vascular surgery certainly is not uh, uh, completely denying the options of open surgery and some patients for some patients it's actually a better option or the only option but we tend to offer them endovascular treatment first simply because of the fact that what's involved here is much less than open surgery. So mortality rate, the morbidity rate is much less. It's all done under local anaesthetic so patient is awake. The procedures themselves are um, can be relatively straightforward and for certain procedures which in the past required a bypass surgery lasting an hour to two to three hours and requiring stay in hospital for a week or so to recover. Uh, these days it can be done within perhaps half an hour to an hour with the recovery being excellent within 24 hours and patient going home with just a minor puncture in the groin the next day. Some of our patients seem to have multiple levels of disease and quite long segments of arterial stenosis. The are they the ones that are going for open surgery or can you stent no, that's, kind of that's, 15 that's different a, places? That's a very interesting question. Uh, when the endovascular treatment started, obviously short lesions, various focal stenosis were yeah. the only lesions that were able to be treated. So whoever had a long segment of, for example, superficial femoral artery occlusion present was pretty much uh, the fact of going straight away for the open bypass surgery. These days, it's actually very different. We are able to recanalize vessels that were chronically occluded over a distance of 20 to 30 centimeters or even longer. Technology has moved forward so fast and so far that uh, it is possible because of the equipment which is available. Mm -hmm. And probably one of the biggest advances in the recent years was development of stenting and uh, in tibial vessels. Mm -hmm. This was an area where, which was very, very difficult to manage even with open surgery and uh, quite so often. So just because they're thin or because they because bend Because they're very so small much. vessels, because they're very calcified in diabetic patients or patients with renal impairment, because the surgery is very demanding, long, and recovery rates are um, associated with fairly high morbidity and mortality up to 5%. So not every patient who obviously presented with critical limb ischemia and had a number of comorbidities was really fit for three to four hour op open operation to have a distal bypass. Today we can do the same uh, procedure 
aiming of establishing better flow to the foot where perhaps there's an ulcer or rest pain uh, percutaneously with the local anesthetic only perhaps within hour to two hours we can achieve uh, much better flow recanalized vessel which is occluded angioplasty and stent vessel which has multiple uh, level of stenosis so the results are quite encouraging and it is due to the fact that the equipment mm -hmm. got so much better Okay, now the stents are just uh, like metal mesh, aren't they? That's right. And then they re-epithelialise on the inside. So does the patient need anything other than aspirin afterwards? Depending a little bit on the size of the stent and location uh, where a stent was implanted. So certain stents, for example, in aliac vessels where the flow rates are very high, don't necessarily require special antiplatelet therapy like uh, with clopidogrel, mm -hmm. but the patient just continues with aspirin, which is pretty much standard treatment for anyone with atherosclerosis mm -hmm. or peripheral vascular disease. Uh, however, certain stents in the smaller vessels, um, especially in tibial vessels, where we also tend to uh, deploy stents which are drug eluding stents, yep. Um, those stents um, have to be associated with administration of clopidogrel, but this is a limited period of time when it's required, usually three to six months perhaps, uh, where the stent is fully re -epithelized. Okay, and if we've got uh, somebody who can do a Doppler in a country area, is that sufficient for surveillance? That's right. If someone feels uh, confident with doing arterial study, uh, diagnostic arterial study, then they should be able to assess um, stent or problems, potential problems associated with the stent and discovered some issues that potentially need some further intervention. Now our other big nightmare in the country areas is an aortic aneurysm that might go pop or at least start to leak um, and we do sometimes get patients who have an abdominal ultrasound for some other reason and they will mention a three to four centimetre aortic aneurysm. What sort of surveillance do they require and when do they go for stenting? 6% of older population will develop uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, uh, male population predominantly because male patients are certainly at much higher risk than female patients. So it's a serious problem because, as you've mentioned, very often it's an incidental discovery. So there are no warning signs or symptoms. Patients just have completely, are completely unaware of what's going on until they rupture and rupture rates are horrendously uh, high in terms of mortality, probably just 20% or less will survive rupture and be able to be offered urgent operation and being in the country that the risk is obviously much higher yeah. because quite often by the time it's diagnosed and patient is transferred this is pretty much too late. Yeah, now my memory is of patients who are kind of split from here to here but again you do this from an yeah, endovascular route This has changed, that's right, the, 15, the last 15 years has brought a phenomenal change and again with a huge benefit to patients. So these days, I would probably very safely say that around 90 to 95% of patients with abdominal aortic aneurysms are managed endovascularly. So they are managed with stent grafts. The threshold for repair of the aneurysm is still the same, with, even with the stent grafts. Uh, all the mortality rates are much less than 1%. So and what's that threshold? The threshold is five centimeters. So it's in our Australian circumstances, it's five centimeters. Perhaps um, in some countries it will be 5.5 centimetres, but generally speaking in Australia, if aneurysm reaches 5 centimetres or more, patient needs to be referred for further assessment because then the risk of rupture is fairly significant and exceeding, uh, quite uh, clearly exceeding the risk of associated with the surgery, especially with the endovascular treatment. The treatment itself um, involves uh, patient admission for further assessment and that usually involves uh, uh, organizing CT angiogram. This provides enough anatomical information about the possibility of performing stent grafts because not everyone can have a standard stent graft. Are these the people with aberrant anatomy or just... No, people with especially suprarenal aneurysm or thoracoabdominal aneurysms, so patients uh, who in old days would be very unlikely to be able to be operated on because of the fact that surgery was of such a high mortality and morbidity and very few centers will have experience in uh, operating on thoracoabdominal or thoracic aneurysms fairly safely with the good results. Here in Perth we are privileged because Michael Lawrence Brown has developed a lot of bases for endoluminal stent grafting 
and in fact uh, the expertise um, and experience available here allows us to do very complicated stand grafts and there are not too many centers in the world which will be able to deliver that sort of service so we are quite privileged and lucky that we can offer patients with, even with very complicated aneurysms um, a possibility of endovascular treatment which suddenly gives them much better chances of survival and good recovery. Mm -hmm. Now these things look like a, um, a metal framework with a tent on it. That's right, yeah. They look uh, quite uh, interesting and daunting sometimes when you look at them. So we can suddenly deploy things uh, which uh, once they open up and uh, deployed look just like this example of the fenestrated strand graft. There's usually some metal framework which is mm -hmm. either made of nitinol or stainless steel and there's some impermeable material which is sewn to that uh, framework. This is all collapsed to the little tube which is measuring on average around five to seven millimeters in diameter. So it can be delivered via a very small incision in the groin or sometimes even percutaneously. Mm -hmm. And the uh, procedure itself still requires general anesthetic but the risk of major complications is much less than 20%. Uh, in fact, mortality is less than 1%, whereas open, proce open procedures will be associated with at least 5% mortality, so it's a big gain for the patients. It takes for the very standard stand graft to, to perhaps uh, to be com completed, it takes approximately an hour and a half to two That's hours. Considerable so it's improvement on it's the faster. old aneurysm surgery. And most of the patients will just have two small incisions in each groin or even sometimes just a percutaneous, completely percutaneous procedure with no even incisions required. So, uh, Marek, this, this fabric, this is the same as the, um, the mesh for a stent, you just need aspirin afterwards? That's right. Uh, these materials are uh, very safe not to be necessarily associated with anything stronger than aspirin, so aspirin is absolutely sufficient to be continued in those patients. They don't need to go onto warfarin and they don't need to go into, uh, onto treatment with clopidogrel either. Fantastic, and then we just uh, manage their cholesterol and their other risk factors as we normally would. It's very would. important, yeah, so we can't just stop at the, uh, at the level of procedure saying now everything is fixed and everything is fine. They still need management of their risk factors, so they need to be managed in terms of their hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, smoking. all of this, all of this, <laughs> and smoking. That's, that's very important, one of the main risk factors for development of aneurysmal disease. So once we have that under control, the likelihood of further problems uh, is much, much less. Mary, that's great. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much.